She had morals and ethics, and she still wins. In fact, you might say multiple people win, which is the other beautiful part of business. We can have multiple winners. It does, it's not a win at all cost game. Multiple people can win, and the best business deals that I've ever done is where the advertiser is successful, the reader gets something of value, and I get some payment in return. Everyone wins. And so that's the beautiful part. And so this gives me inspiration. But Katniss had some other characteristics that I think are really valuable. And they're, they're exhibited in my friend who actually lives down the street in Lehigh. His name's Eric Anderson. Some of you may know him. Uh, he lives in Lehigh, but I actually came to know him when I moved to Hawaii. When I moved to Hawaii, he was my neighbor there. And I came to know him. Uh, he, his family was excellent to us and took really good care of us because it was like moving to a third world country. If you've never moved to Hawaii, I mean, it's fun to vacation there, but moving there is a totally different experience. So they took good care of us, and I came to know him really well. Well, he has cystic fibrosis. If you're not familiar with cystic fibrosis, you essentially can't create something that makes all the mucus in your lungs disappear. You're missing that chemical ingredient. And so he has to do this therapy called percussion therapy, which is a nice way to say that you literally go to him and beat the crap out of him in order to knock the mucus loose from his lungs. So I would go over, and actually Alan here does it now, which I'm so grateful for since it's my friend. But I would go over to his house and literally, as hard as I could, beat on him for about 30 minutes. And you would do it in three positions, sitting up, laying down, and upside down. And you do it on the side, on the back, and right here. Can you imagine getting beat like this with your hands, as hard as you can, for this whole time? And one time he said to me, as he was getting into the appropriate position upside down, and I was about to beat on his chest for, I can't remember how long, it's a minute or two that you beat on him in each position. I was about to beat him, he said, John, this really sucks. <laughs> He's like, this is really awful, it hurts so bad. And, and he's like, do you know why I do it? And I was like, why? He said, because all of my friends that didn't do it are dead. Wow, that's an interesting thing. Well, if you, look at, if you look at Eric's story, he is 62 years old. Guess how long most cystic fibrosis people live? 37 years on average. He's 62. He's defied all odds. And why did he defy all odds? Because he was willing to do things that other people were not willing to do. Turns out that's the same for entrepreneurship. If you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to do things that other people won't do, don't want to do, it's too hard to do, that, that won't, you know, that's not fun, right? Sometimes entrepreneurship's not fun. But you realize that's what's going to make the difference in your business. And I think you'll see that in my story as well. So, like he said, I'm a blogger. I have uh, about 20 blogs across four niches. I've been blogging for about 10 years. And it's been really fun. You know, and when people say, what is your job? I say, I'm a blogger. And they always look at me and they're like, well, you know, my wife blogs. And <laughs> it's like, oh, no, that's not quite the same. I mean, it's kind of is. In fact, they have this picture that says, yeah, OK, I write stories. I take cool pictures. I share it with my friends and family. And I make millions. And is that how it works? Well, not really, right? I mean, they, they think that you just are going to blog and money just floats down, you know? like. I think they were wrong in that movie where it said, if you build it, they will come, right? Well, if you build it, you may make money, or you may not, right? It depends on what else you do, is the reality of this. And so, you know, there are a few exceptions, right? I mean, the pet rocks seem to just have money flow down. I don't know why people are actually spending money on this. There was a million-dollar homepage. How genius. He charged one dollar per pixel, and he had a million pixels, and he made a million dollars off of it. But even these have hard ideas, right? Like, what's the sustainable effort for the pet rock? How do you keep convincing people to buy a rock? Right? <laughs> they can just go grab one for free. In fact, some people will pay you to take their rocks, right? And same with the million dollar homepage, it's full. Now you just made a million dollars, but what do you do next, right? Are you going to do another million pixels? Well, now it's not interesting, so then no one will fill it. So it has its own challenges. But let me tell you about how I started. This is emrhippa.com. It was my first site. In fact, this is literally what my first website looked like. And the black ones were actually ads. Of course, the uh, archive doesn't show the ads since they were dynamic. But this is what it looked like. Doesn't that look impressive? Doesn't that make you want to visit this site? So beautiful. I mean, look at all the pictures. Oh, wait. No, there weren't any pictures, right? 
In fact, look at this post right here, free software in this. And if you read it in detail, it would essentially say that I found someone else created a list, and here's the ones I found interesting. That's some great content, right? I was working really hard to create amazing content. I mean, there's so many things wrong with this website. It's not beautiful, it's not attractive. There's so many mistakes. And guess what the URL for this website was? CrashUtah.com slash EMR. That makes sense if you're going to write about EMR, which, by the way, EMR is electronic medical record. But uh, if you wanted to visit an electronic medical record <coughs> website, wouldn't you go to CrashUtah.com slash EMR? That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> no, um, why is it on CrashUtah? Well, I own the domain. That's another story for another time. That's that was my first failure, I guess you could say. It was, it was like city search for Utah County and a crash. That was supposed to be crash a party. But anyways, uh, you know, I had the domain. I didn't want to pay $10 a year for a domain. I'm not going to waste money. Why would I do that? I don't even know if this is going to work. So I said, let me just throw it up on here. It's free. I can try it out. And I did it. I mean, if you look at this, this is wrong in so many ways. But it doesn't matter, right? When you're starting out, those mistakes are okay. But I wanted to get it out and see what would happen. I mean, I literally put ads on it from day one because I wanted it to make money. In fact, my goals at the beginning were, I want to learn about EMR and share what I learned. I figured it's a good resume builder, and I wanted to be the first page of Google for EMR. I was learning how to do search engine optimization. I figured that was valuable and it was a fun thing to do. So I started working on that, and I started going crazy. I mean, I was working on this all the time. And I was writing all these articles, and I was writing hundreds of posts. I was commenting on this EMR forum that was on the first page of Google for EMR, for that search term. I commented a thousand times over the first six months. I mean, I was fully invested trying to build this and make some money. And I knew that if I got traffic there, I would make money because my ads would show that. When they clicked on it, I was making you know, a dollar to $15 per click. So I was like, oh, all I need to do is increase my traffic. And so I was going hardcore at it, and I was building it as much as possible. So what did I do in that first six months, back to the kind of build message, what did I do that no one else wanted to do? Who wants to blog about electronic medical record? Anyone in here? Yeah. I didn't think so, right? Let alone HIPAA. You don't even know what HIPAA is. It's a privacy agreement. Doctors hate it, abhor it. They don't want to read about it. That's boring as all get out, right? I mean, do you want to go comment a thousand times on another forum? How about, you know, writing thousands of comments on other blogs in order to try to drive traffic to your site, right? Which is another thing that I did in that time. Do you want to write hundreds of posts? And then the best part is when you write hundreds of posts, you actually get people commenting and ripping you apart saying you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about, and then they correct you and all this, right? Does this sound like fun? Right? This is a good... I actually, you know... It does take a hit to the ego when someone comments on your blog and rips you apart. But for me, it's great. It's such a good learning experience because I learned so much from them. Because either they're right, and oh, thank you, you just taught me something new. Or they're wrong, and I'm going to fight against it, right? I'm going to tell them why they're wrong. So it's a beautiful thing, but you know, these are all things that are really challenging. For the first six months, I was doing all of this for essentially date money. Like, it was enough money to take my wife out on a date. It wasn't much more, right? And I was working really hard, and it didn't seem like so much. Well, I did learn an important lesson on that, which I actually didn't realize until much later. And this is an important lesson for every entrepreneur. And it's, I spent as much time marketing my blog as I did actually writing the content. In fact, it's the failure of almost every blogger. If you see a blogger and they're like, oh, I wish I could make money, guess what? They're probably just writing content and they're not spending time actually driving people to read their blog. If they did that, that would make total difference. In fact, it's true. You can have the most beautiful product in the world that solves everyone's problems, but if you don't spend enough time on marketing, it really doesn't matter. So that's a lesson for every business. You have to spend as much time marketing it. Now, certainly there are certain products that are easier to market than others, and building a beautiful product makes it much easier to market than others, but you have to spend time on that. Well, after that six months, I kind of reached my goal. I reached the first page of Google for EMR. I was like, yay, I'm awesome. I built it up to about 1,000 page views a day, and I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. I got it to 1,000 page views a day, and I've been trying everything possible to build it as big as I could, because I knew it was just a multiple, right? If I have 10 times more traffic, 
I'm going to make more money. That's easy, right? That's easy to see. And then I sat there for a minute, and I was like, geez, I've been working really hard for six months. I'm on the first page of Google for EMR. Maybe no one reads this crap, right? Like, <laughs> if I'm a doctor, which is who I wanted to read it, do I go home and read about electronic medical records or HIPAA at night? That doesn't sound like fun. That doesn't sound like something I do. I was like, maybe I have a whole market. Maybe that's all there is, and there just isn't a big enough market for me. So what do I do? I quit. Well, I didn't really quit. I mean, it was still making date money, and people were just saying, hey, can I put an ad on there? I'm like, sure, uh, $50, yeah, whatever. I was making a little money, so I kept doing it. I maybe post twice a month, but I basically set it to the side and just was collecting some checks. It was nice, you know? It's good to have. And then I started exploring other things. I found this thing called Paper Post where they pay you to blog about certain things. I'd written this post about So You Think You Can Dance, the TV show, and I literally copied a piece of code and put it on my website, and I made $15. I was like, wait, I just did copy and paste, and I made $15? Like, That's pretty good. So I started doing it like crazy, and from that I, I learned all sorts of things, including discovering another niche, which is my TV website. This is my most popular one today, Pure DWTS. And I learned in this process of doing all these paid posts, well, what do advertisers want from a blogger? I also learned, because I started doing search engine optimization, well, this new thing called Twitter came about. So I started learning about that, and Facebook, and all of these things started coming out. So I started learning social media marketing. So over these years, I, started, I had all the search engine stuff, which is great. But then that, through these TV sites and paper posts and other efforts that I did, I also learned about social media and how to drive traffic through it. And it's hard work, right? I mean, learning all of that pays off because there's valuable business, business there. And so that's when I discovered the, the TV stuff. And so I, I learned over these years as I was working on these different sites is that, you know, you have to persevere. I could have just given up and said, oh, blogging is awful, maybe you can never make money blogging. No, I kept exploring and trying to discover what are the ways that work. And I was learning in the process. There's so much learning that you can go in, even if you fail. In fact, some of the best learnings come from the failures. That's an important thing for life. So all this time I'm learning, while this EMR website is over here, just petering along, sending me a check every month, which is nice. You know, I'm making a few hundred dollars every month. But then I discovered and learned about social media marketing, all these things. Well then, after four years, I got lucky. Well, entrepreneurs don't really like to talk about luck. In fact, there's people who just spent their time focusing on, is entrepreneurship luck? Is it timing? Is it skill? Is it born? Is it bread? And they can speak to this a lot better than me, right? We don't really like to talk about luck as entrepreneurship, and that, oh, we were successful because we were lucky, right? I mean, we, no one, almost no one has gotten successful as a business with just luck. They usually have to work hard and have some luck. Some people prefer to call it timing. But you know, let's, let me use an example from Dance with the Stars. Even if you know Julianne Huff, she's been on Dance with Stars, won a few times. Then she became the CMA Music Rookie of the Year, whatever that award is. And then she's been in Safe Haven. But there's, anyway, she's a big movie star now. She's a judge on Dance with the Stars, right? And people look at her like, wow, you're so lucky. Dancing with the Stars came to you, and you've got to be on the show, and now you have this great career. It's like, well, was she lucky? They didn't talk about the fact that for the past 15 years, she'd been learning how to dance. She'd been learning how to sing. She literally left her family and went to England for, I can't remember, four or five years of her life and to dance and to sing. So was that lucky that 15 years later, after all of this hard work, all of this training, all of this effort, she was successful? <laughs> the same thing for my blog. Right after four years, was I lucky that something happened after four years of hard work and trying to optimize my blogs and trying to do the best I could with them? Well, for me, I mean, there is some amount of luck that Obama decided to pass the stimulus package known as ARA. It was a trillion dollar stimulus package and $32 billion of that was for electronic medical record. Well, that really unsexy EMR topic that I'd been writing about for four years and I was on the first page of Google for just became really sexy, right? <laughs> At least $32 billion sexy. <laughs> Right? It became really interesting. Everyone started doing it. And I actually saw it really early. 
And so I started writing about it, and I, I saw all we knew was government money and EMR. That's basically it. So I wrote about it, and I started writing. In fact, over that next year, I wrote every single day on two different blogs that I have on, on electronic medical records, some topic related to that, and mostly talking about, oh, there's $32 million coming. In fact, at the time, we didn't even know how much it was. We didn't know anything. But this is the spike that happened. I mean, literally, I could do it with my other site. The same spike happened. And if you extend it out, it continues. That spike uh, continues to trend. And if you look before this, it was even smaller traffic, right? So this major spike happened. I got lucky. Was it luck? Was it timing? Yeah, absolutely. But then I also put in the work, right? So the lesson here is be ready. When these opportunities come, if I had just said, oh, great, this is coming. I'm going to get some more traffic. I wouldn't be here today. I'd still be making a couple hundred dollars a month. Maybe I'd make five, six hundred. That's not enough to live on. Well, maybe for you guys, but not for me and I have kids. Right? So, you know, I had to capitalize on that. And I started posting like crazy every single day, literally. Granted, some days I'd write seven posts and schedule them for a week. But every single day, a new post came out on my blogs. In fact, it happened on two of my sites. And so I worked really hard and built that. And my trap, my ads went from $50 a month to $400 a month. And I didn't just have one advertiser, I had 10 advertisers. And they were all paying six times as much because I was able to capitalize on this great opportunity. But it's because I put the work in before and I was ready to pounce on that opportunity. So it's time to quit the full-time job, right? And it sounds like great. The problem with this idea of quitting your full-time job is it feels like this. Like, oh, I don't have to work for anyone again. Yay, but really, this is what it's more like. It's like, oh, crud. Am I going to be able to make enough money? I had two or three kids at the time to provide for my wife and my kids. My wife wasn't working. It's like, I got a mouse to feed, right? This is kind of scary. Am I okay to do this, right? I mean, if you looked at it, we, we learned an important lesson. I learned one in college. My accounting teacher taught me something. He said, live modestly. He said, you as students, which applies to you guys as well, you live on nothing. You make almost no money and you're living fine. He said, when you get your first job, don't just go crazy. He said, no, you don't have to eat ramen every day, but live modestly. Live well, live with your needs. Well, as my blogs grew, we were making about 75% of what we needed to live from the blogs. We could have just grown our income, bought a lot of toys, traveled all over the world, but we decided to live modestly. So we lived well below what we were actually earning. What, what did that do? One, it put a lot of savings away. And two, it made it so when I had the choice to quit the job, it was much easier because we didn't need as much to live. But what happened is I ended up going to this HIMSS conference. This is the big health IT conference. 37,000 people, 1,300 vendors. Turns out I was wrong. There were a lot of people who care about electronic medical records. I hadn't found them yet. I went to this conference. I was invited to be on the Meet the Bloggers panel. And it was awesome. I felt like a fish out of water. I was a nobody from Las Vegas, right? I didn't know any of these people. And they threw me into the wolves, right? I was there amongst everyone. And they were, you know, I just felt totally overwhelmed with all of these people. And I felt like nobody had put me on this Meet the Bloggers panel. And someone asked, how many of you are full-time bloggers? And I was like, and I talked this over with my wife, and although I didn't tell her I was going to do it this way. But anyway, they so said, how many of you are full-time bloggers? They came to me and I was like, well, it's funny you ask that. When I get back from this conference, I'm going to quit my day job and be a full-time blogger. Which is really interesting because once you tell that to a few hundred people at a big conference, you better do it, right? <laughs> no turning back then, which is a powerful thing. But I was still scared, right? I mean, I was scared. Could I be successful? I'm just a nobody in Las Vegas. How could I have influence over this massive industry, this electronic medical record industry? I, you know, I was quite overwhelmed. I even did a new media meetup there. And my goal was just, will anyone show up? I, in fact, one of my friends now, she came to that, and she, saw, she met me, and she asked me some questions, and she said, after I met you, I thought you were a total prick. She said, I thought you were a jerk. I didn't want to meet you. She since, thankfully, changed her mind and said, oh, he's not so bad. I, I realized what happened. She thought I was a jerk because I was just so overwhelmed. I didn't know what it was. I was this fish out of water doing something, like, well beyond my pay grade, right? Like, they call it the imposter syndrome, which every entrepreneur faces. You feel like you're an imposter. Like, even whether you are or you're not, you may feel that way. And you have to overcome it and just 
push forward anyways. By the way, that was a great event. We had Kobe Filet. We had the whole aquarium in Atlanta. It was awesome. And some people actually showed, which I was like, yeah, it gave me some confidence, right? But then something else happened. I realized that there was power in my niche. In fact, I was sitting in the press room with this guy who became a mentor, and actually now he's a partner in a, another company with me. And I talked to him, and he told me how much he thought my dogs were worth. And I was like, oh, really? You think they're worth that much? I didn't even know. So the fact having a mentor there to tell me, hey, you're worth more than you are. Even though you're a nobody in Las Vegas, you have a lot of value. It was so powerful to me to have that. So those are my two lessons from that. One is find your niche. Maybe I'm not going to be the most biggest social media one. I'm not going to be the next Kim Kardashian, right? And I'm not, you know, the right angles or whatever, right? <laughs> you know, I don't have that same assets. Is that the right way to say that? You know, that she has, right? But I have something else, and I can be influential in my niche, right? So I can have that. And then having a mentor that helps you have that confidence is really powerful because they can help you understand and see that you're worth more than you realize. So let's shift gears real quick in this uh, last few minutes because I know this is going to be your first question. Because whenever I tell people I'm a blogger, they first say, oh, well, my wife blogs. That's my favorite one. Uh, and then they always ask, and it's usually in some sort of skeptical kind of manner, like, so you make you can make money money? Like almost like it's the seventh one of the world, right? Like that really happens? Like people, you know, like cash comes in and, and like and and then usually they haven't even processed it. I do it full time and I've done it full time for the past five years. Right? Like they, they can't even do that. So I'm sure that many of you are saying, wait, how do you make money blogging? Is that a fair assessment? So let me just give you some ideas of how you can make money. There's so many ways, but here's some of them. And here's here the evolution that I went through. Initially, I was selling links. People wanted the link on my site because I was on the first page of Google and they were trying to help their site. Bad strategy today. Do not sell links today. Google will kill you for it, so don't look at that one necessarily. But that's where it started, right? And then it evolved to display advertising. Everyone's familiar with that. You have a banner ad or some sort of image on your site that people can click on, and there's lots of variations. They have a uh, paper click. Anyway, I could talk to you a lot more about this, but that's a topic for another discussion. So definitely put banners on there. It's really beautiful because you put it up and you just make money, right? Like, I love banner ads. As long as you can deliver the right quality, it's great. And if you're on an EMR site, like, is a banner ad for a solution that might help you in your job? Is that really an ad? Think about that. Or if you want it in your perspective. If you visit a car site and you love cars, is, it, is an ad for a Ferrari really an ad? Or is it a piece of content? Anyway, that's where the evolution of display advertising has gone. After that, I started doing a lot of affiliate marketing. You can go on Amazon right now, sign up as an affiliate, and if you leave that person to buy something on Amazon, they'll pay you 6% commission. And that actually grows if you sell more. So you can sell literally anything on Amazon and they pay you 6%. Pretty good, right? If I'm selling a $1,000 scan scanner to a doctor's office, that's pretty good commission. And you can sell a lot of those. That's good. Uh, email marketing. So certainly, People will pay me just to email something for their company, or on top of the email, essentially a display ad on top of the email. There's a lot of money in emails. Lead generation. So I can make, if you give me a doctor's office with their phone number, name, title, things like that, a doctor or a practice manager, I can make anywhere from $50 to $250 per week. And there's companies that will pay for that. In fact, there's companies that will provide you all the tools you need to collect that lead, to capture that lead, and then they pay you fully. Pretty good, right? So there's lots of lead generation. And if this, and that's true in any industry. I mean, if you want to do credit cards, they'll pay you about $50 per credit card uh, submission, something like that. So lead generation is another way I make money. This is where everything has gone for me over the past 10 years. Everyone now wants to do what they call sponsored content. They want to be part of the content. They want me to say, oh, Canon has scanners. But we want to be more than that. We want to be in the content. We want you to talk about why does the medical office need a scanner? Oh, and by the way, this is sponsored by Canon, right? So that's the way that it's all headed as sponsored content. Many of you are probably saying, wait, what about the ethical issue of sponsored content? And there certainly are a lot, right? 
And you could sell your soul to the devil, I mean, back to the hunger dangers analogy, right? If you do it the wrong way. But if you do it the right way, it's actually really valuable. Let me give you an example. I have these consulting companies that their whole job is to say, we know what we're talking about when implementing an earth vehicle. When I implement an electronic medical record in a hospital or a doctor's office, I know what I'm talking about, and you should pay me to come in and help. Well, they actually get sponsored content on my blogs. Well, they're paying me $2,000, and then they provide me the blog post, and all I have to do is post it. Why do they want to do that? They want access to my audience, and they want to be seen as an expert that knows what they're talking about. Now, think about that from a reader perspective. These experts are coming and providing amazing content to them for free. Is that a bad thing? No, right? I mean, like, in fact, many of these consultants will write much better content than I would write. Because <laughs> they're digging in it. They're dealing with hundreds of customers at a time. And so they write this really, really amazing content, and then they pay me to publish it. That's brilliant, right? And then here's the other catch. Then they go after they have published it, and then they promote it to everyone they know and say, check it out, we were published on John's website. And so they actually promote you as well. This is sponsored content. There's a lot of other options like Twitter chats, so people will pay me literally to host a Twitter chat, which is basically an hour period where we talk about certain topics, and I invite other people to participate, and then we talk for an hour on some topic. You know, maybe it's privacy and security and healthcare or whatever, right? And I have enough reach, they want me to do that, and I just say, this Twitter chat is sponsored by so-and-so, or the name of the Twitter chat. For example, I, I get paid to do one called the Cario chat, and the company's name is Cario. So it's obviously a great branding opportunity for that company. And so they pay for me to do it, and I bring the people to participate. And obviously webinars are another form of sponsored content. You can host a webinar. People love that because then everyone has to sign up. Well now, if you have 200 people sign up for a webinar, that's great. They can now market their products to you. So there's a whole wide variety of options that are available to make money. These are, I think, the most popular ones. And the last one that most people like to do, although I haven't done nearly as much, is what they call a product. So if you can develop the product yourself that you're going to sell, that can be extremely, extremely valuable. The challenge is now you become a different company, right? And you have to start developing the product, and you have to develop the product that someone will buy. Sometimes it's as simple as maybe a course, an online course, and you want to sell it. Well, now you make 100% commission, right? Whereas maybe if you did that with the affiliate, other people have both built courses, you send them to that course, you only make 50% or whatever. If you build it yourself, you keep it all. Right? So you can build products on top of it and sell it as well. So, what's interesting is I've taken a very unique approach to entrepreneurship. Many companies that probably have come and talked to you, it's really about people. How do you scale people? And that's really valuable, and that's a proven model across so many businesses. But my approach is how do you build assets? In this electronic world that nobody in Las Vegas should not be able to influence the healthcare IT industry. But that's exactly what I've done. Right? That's why people pay me money. It's because this nobody in Las Vegas built these great assets. I mean, think about that. In, in just healthcare IT, I think I have 12,000 blog posts. Try competing with that in search engines, 12,000 blog posts. It's just a tremendous asset. I mean, if you look at it across all of them, I have 30,000 email subscribers. I asked, you know, you know, you know on the social media, almost 120,000 social media followers, right? That's a lot of people. I asked uh, one of the marketing people of a company that could potentially buy me. And then I said, how much would it cost you to build what I've created? You know, how long would it take? How much money? She's like, John, I'm not sure we could. It's like, great. That's valuable, right? <laughs> that means we've created something of, of real value. How much is it worth? You know, I, I won't know until I sell. Which, you know, maybe I'll find out someday. But there's a lot of value. In fact, I mean, that's, I think, the message I want for you guys. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter who you are. If you have influence, you've created a lot of value. And you can build a business without the value. And I don't care if you do it as a blogger. I don't care if you do it on Twitter. If you do it on Instagram. If you do it on YouTube. If you do it on Vine. If you have that following, you have people who listen to what you say, 
There are lots of ways to monetize that. There's lots of ways to make money on that. And you can build a great business on top of that. In fact, if you think about the movie, uh, uh, the newspaper movie, uh, I just forgot the name of it, uh, where the Newsies, right? That Newsies. You know, at one point, Hearst, who owns the newspaper, he says, I tell them what to think, right? That's kind of what we're doing online. If you have influence online in social media, on blogs, on YouTube, then you tell people what to think in some ways, right? You can share that, and you can, and you can share some of your influence and make money. In fact, some of you may be thinking, well, I don't want to be a blogger, I don't even want to be an entrepreneur, how does this even apply to me? Well, the reality is that I've found, as I've been doing this, is that every company is a media company. Or at least could benefit from being a media company. It's amazing to me how many companies are building up blog networks in order to sell their product. Or that are building up their social media following, or that are doing videos, or are doing regular ones. I mean, it's just crazy. They're essentially becoming media companies because they know that they have to be a media company in order to get the eyeballs focused on them so that then they can sell whatever other product they want to sell. So no matter where you go to work, you can take these same principles that apply and says if I become an influencer in whatever niche space I've got, then I can sell it. And that's a powerful concept. You can see some of my, you know, the details that I've talked about them. And then actually some updated numbers from like, yeah, but it, it always changes because I always keep creating more and more views. But you know, it's amazing to look at this. And, you know, even I sit back and I think, wow, 21,000 blog posts. That is a lot of content over 10 years. And I've written probably about half of them myself. I have writers that have written probably the other half. Like, that is a lot of content. I mean, just even sitting back and I'm like, wow, I didn't even know I did that. But what's the real key to my success, I think? It's slow and steady. I didn't approach it as I want to dominate the world, I want to you know, do this and build this massive empire because of it. I just slowly and steadily just kept building assets. Just kept building something else and bigger. I'd learn something new, I'd start piling it on. Oh, Twitter started? Let's start Twitter and see if we can get some traffic there. You know, I've been doing Pinterest. Pinterest can drive a ton of traffic. Right? All these new platforms, now I'm exploring Periscope and um, uh, what's the other one? Lab, which is a video streaming one. How could that do, right? So I'm exploring and building more and more assets along the way. And the slow and steady approach can build massively beautiful things and a massively beautiful business. So that's my message. I thought I'd uh, leave a few minutes for questions. If any of you have questions about blogging, entrepreneurship, uh, how did you get into EMR in the first place? How did I get the EMR? Get into it. Why did oh. you start blogging about EMR? So how did I get into EMR? Like why did I, I mean, yeah, it was, it's actually kind of funny. I was, I was working in Hawaii. We wanted to come back to the mainland. And so I found a job at UNLV and their health and counseling center. And they were implementing in, in EMR. In fact, during the job interview, they asked me the question, right? The all-important question, what's your experience in healthcare? And I'm sure I answered, I've been to the doctor or something stupid <laughs> like that, right? And I, I, I'm sure I corrected it. It was like, oh, well, my project management experience will carry over to this, right? Yeah, I had none. I, I knew nothing. In fact, when I was training on the EMR at my first job, they were training me on healthcare more than they were training me on, on the software. Like, I was like, oh, yeah, I already know the software. Yeah, it turns yellow. That's required to keep going. And then I was like, what's a CPT code? What's ICD-9? I don't know. I was cool this, right? <coughs> so, but that was actually part of why I started the blog as well. I didn't know anything about it. I figured I'd share with the world. But yeah, so I got a job in front of the EMR at UNLV, and uh, that's how I started. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so, is there like a source or a place you go to learn how to do social marketing? Social media marketing? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's tons, right? And that, that's, that's actually one of the challenges. There's almost too much info out there. I didn't actually mention killer blogging. <coughs> so, killerblogging.com is actually my answer to the question when someone says, how do I make money blogging? 
that's like what I created. I did it partially for my riders, so they would know what they need to know in order to write for me. But I also did it because everyone said, wait, how do you make money blogging? I don't want to make money blogging. So I say go there, go to blogging.com. It's like an online resource that basically takes you through how do you select the right topics, uh, you know, and then it goes into a lot of that, you know, like how do you do the search engine optimization? What about Twitter, social media, some of that. So I mean, that, that's obviously I'm biased to that resource, but uh, more specifically to social media, there's so many free resources out there, you should be very hesitant to pay for anything. Uh, you know, go to like HubSpot puts out a great blog about it. Uh, Copy Blogger does great work. Uh, you know, that they put out. I mean, there's so many, right? Uh, you know, just uh, you know, if you search and you find it. My approach is this, right? Because there is so much, I like to triangulate. So Copy Blogger says this, HubSpot says this, and you know, Chris Brogan says this. Okay, so let me see what. You know, how do these overlap? And then I test and try and dive into it and just experience it. So they said if I do this, I'm going to get this result, so let me try it, right? And then you go in and say, okay, uh, you know, maybe they tell you the strategy is follow a bunch of people on Twitter that are in your niche, and a bunch of them will follow you back. Go and try it, right? If you love writing about sports, follow all of those sports people, put out some content, right, so they, you're worthy of following, and you'll see it, they'll follow you back. So I mean, that's, that's my approach, is really you know, triangulating multiple people's <coughs> opinions, and then diving in and just experiencing it. The reality is it's really hard to go wrong. What do you guys have to lose? At this point, nothing, right? <laughs> you don't have a business. So go out and experience it. You're not going to lose it. Yeah, except for the time I went on TMZ accidentally. But that's another story. <laughs> it, it was not the best experience. But it was OK. It was probably about 10,000 views. In one Any other questions? I think the sponsored content has potentially ethical ones. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so one of the ethical issues that I ran into, you said I said I ran into a bunch. Uh, the one is uh, sponsored content, obviously. If they're paying for you, how do you balance that? For me, the key there has always been uh, full disclosure of any financial relationship. So if you're an advertiser on my site and I write about you, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise, at the bottom or at the top or wherever, I say, so-and-so is an advertiser on this site and pays me for this or whatever. So you know, it turns out the FTC actually requires that disclosure, so it's good to do legally as well. But uh, it's good ethically, and it actually builds your relationship with that person. Because they know that whenever you write something, you're going to disclose it, then they can trust everything else that you're going to write. So it actually, you know, it turns out being ethical is better in, in the long run and in the short run. Uh, other ethical challenges, um, you know, I try to stay away from it, but you know, there's a lot of people, especially in the search engine optimization space or even the affiliate marketing space, they do all sorts of crazy stuff. It's really ugly. I mean, I had one guy tell me, yeah, we were pumping a bunch of traffic to this landing page to try to convert people to buy this product. I forget what it was. And they weren't buying it. And so we put this as seen on TV image on there. And the traffic went up. And we got this massive increase in conversions. And people were buying the product. I was like, well, was it <coughs> seen on TV? No. We just put it on there. It's like, uh, <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> right? Like, you know, uh, you know, so there are a lot of people that don't care, right? I mean, unfortunately. And uh, you know, I think that's a, a short-term strategy that they pay the price for later. But uh, yeah, there's lots of stuff. Like that. Any other questions? We have a few minutes, right? Of all of those revenue streams that you listed, um, is there one or two that you say are at the top of the list that generally seem to generate more revenue than others? So I've made most of my money through display advertising through the years. So, okay, so, so what were the revenue, you asked the question, what are the revenue streams that I made the most money on uh, through the years? Uh, and it's evolved, I think. Uh, the display advertising has always been the bread and butter for me. And I actually really love it because it's kind of set it and forget it. <laughs> you set it up, you put it in the ad server, and it delivers all the views, and it tells you the clicks, and it tells you all that information. But people, there's, there's some trends called banner blindness you may have heard about, 
where they say, oh, you don't see the banner, and you guys maybe have ad blocking software on yours, so that's another issue potentially that has to do with banners. I think that's more true in the consumer space than it is in the enterprise space. I mean, visitors to my blog actually like the ads because they like to know what other opportunities are there, what other solutions are available. So, you know, I think that there's a reframing of what's a display ad. And, you know, I'm trying, my goal in that shift is how do I shift a display ad so it's as good as the content? And that's why I tell the advertiser, could you provide me something that my readers would think is so valuable that they're like, I just want to go to John's site to see the ads. I mean, that, that's a pretty cool concept, right? And they're paying you for it. That's great. And it, it can work out well. But yeah, I mean, it saves a massive shift to the sponsored content. Uh, you know, they'll pay all sorts of money to be in the content. And at first I went and I told them, I said, do you want to be on this display ad to have it? They're like, no, 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 I don't do that. Okay, well, how about you do six sponsored blog posts? You know, it's 15 grand and it's six posts. And, You'll get a lot of exposure. Yeah, we want to be there. Every VP of marketing is like, we have to do that. We want to be part of the conversation. We want to be considered thought leaders. We want to be seen as the people. And, and then they go back and they never buy. And I was really frustrated because I was like, you told me this is what you wanted. Why aren't you buying? You know, like, this is, you want to be thought leaders, but they never cough up the money to actually become one. And I realized what happened is these VP of marketing were going back to, their executives and saying, hey, guess what? For $15,000, we get six blog posts. And these executives would be like, hey, you can do six blog posts for free on our blog. Why would we do that? So I had to reframe it. So what I did now, oh, you don't get six blog posts for that. Those six blog posts get emailed out to 40,000 email addresses. So your content's going to go to 40,000 email addresses. And it's going to be tweeted out to, in the healthcare side, 60,000 social media followers multiple times with mentions of your account. Wow, 60,000, that's good, I like that. Okay, so it's, and then you're going to have a banner ad, because guess what, your post is going to be there once a month, but what happens with the rest of the month? They're not going to see you, so guess what, I'm going to throw in a banner ad, just whether it provides value or not, I'm going to throw it in, and guess what, you're going to get half a million impressions on that banner ad with so many clicks, and now they say, oh, $15,000 for 30,000 emails, 60,000 social media followers and half a million impressions, oh, now the executive can sign, right? And say, oh yeah, we can buy that. Which is what they were getting before, but I just never framed it that way, right? <laughs> so that, that's where everything's going now. I would describe that as a fully integrated marketing campaign across search engine, social media, email. Okay, so, so, so. Thank you so much. We appreciate Mr. Lynn being here today, and thank you for all of your attendance, your questions, and attentiveness. Now go start a blog, right? Right? Thank you. I'm going to stick around for those that are too cut out.